everybody. Welcome to Kelman's Corner. Our guest this week is Gary Varsho. We'll be back to talk to Gary after these words. Gary Varsho is our guest today, former Major League player, former Indianapolis Indian, former big league coach, scout. He's done so many things in this game. Gary, it's great to see you again. Howard, it's great to be with you. Really enjoy, uh, really enjoy seeing you. And, you know, I haven't seen you in a little bit, so COVID kind of put a damper on everything, but it's good to be with some baseball people. Well, thank you. And you've done so many great things in this game, so many accomplishments. Before we get to that, let's talk about your son, Dalton, who was a second-round draft pick. And he's on a hot streak that homered in three straight games for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Well, it's been a process. You know, we're very proud of all the kids, and, and Dalton in particular. Um, just got done with a series in Wrigley and in front of family, which I've, I've experienced that a few times and really didn't do a whole lot at times. But uh, he had a great weekend in Chicago, uh, came up with some big hits, really good at bats, and trying to get over that major league sort of threshold line, do I belong, you know, can I handle it, you know, trying to get his feel there and the anxiety, the nervousness, and, you know, so he's getting some regular playing time. It's really helped, and so we're looking forward to a, a very nice, long career. Well, he's got to be a good athlete because he both catches and plays the outfield, which is an unusual combination. Well, he gets that athleticism, obviously, from his mother. So, you know, um, <laughs> He, uh, he's always been a really good athlete and he's always loved catching and he's engaged. He's, he's in it. And actually I think the catching helps us hitting. I, I, I really do. People look at me like, what do you mean? I said, because he's engaged, he's engaged in the game. And, and the more pitches he sees, the better he is as a hitter. And, uh, even if it's the opposing pitcher, better background. I mean, all those intangibles that people don't think about and really helps him slow himself down and, and actually, sometimes being a little bit tired actually slows himself down a little bit, his mind. So, um, yeah, and he's he, he enjoys it. Now, it's a Diamondbacks choice. What do they want to do with him as far as keeping his – because he can run a little bit. And so I'm sure there's going to be some outfield play come into play here as, as, as his career goes on. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's very comfortable. And, you know, growing up as a little boy, he grew up with me around the ballpark. So he was around a ton of – Really terrific young men, uh, especially in Philadelphia with Jimmy Rollins and Jim Tomey and Kenny Lofton and Chase Utley and Pat Burrell, and the list goes on and on, and be with me in Pittsburgh, you know. So he would travel with me, and he'd get his work in, and so he's been around that big league atmosphere, and, you know, he understands the dedication and what it takes and the work ethic and, and the grind. So it's it's been a blessing. It's been fun. We're, you know, Kay and I are very blessed to have a special person like this in our lives, and he's our son, and it's been enjoyable watching him play. Tell us the story about naming him Dalton. Well, in 1995, I was sitting at home waiting for a job, and the Phillies called, and I was elated that they were looking for someone to fit their part-time bench role. So I, I got into camp late, and the first guy I met was Darren Dalton. Came over, shook my hand. I had played against Darren with the Pirates and, and the Reds and the Cubs. And he came over, shook my hand, and uh, I knew some of the guys in the, in the clubhouse a little bit. And so it ended up with spring training, a you know, small spurt there. And we ended up going to Houston, our first series. And I get up to the phone. I get up to my hotel, and the phone rings, and it's Darren. I mean, there was no cell phones at that time. So it's like Darren calls. He goes, what are you doing? just waiting for my luggage. He goes, get your butt down here. We're going out to eat. And he basically took half the team out and it was going to be opening day in Houston. And we sat around and talked baseball and he continued to do that all through the year. And we became great friends and a, a true, what really was amazing about Darren is a true leader within the clubhouse, the guy, the man, uh, bad knees, you know, played on just guts so many times um, he was the guy that even when I wasn't playing in that games uh, especially at home he'd be in that tunnel 
lathered up, sweating, and he made sure he, like I would come down into the runway and he goes, come on, we need you tonight. And I have never seen anybody like this. This is a true warrior of the game and bust his rear end every night, every, every day. And just like, it was amazing to me. And we created a great friendship. And I, I told Kay, I said, well, if we ever have a son, he's, he's going to be named after Dalton. One of the, the best teammates I've ever had. And just truly, you had to be there to understand it, but he was the main and it was no one else like him. I think you've explained it beautifully and how inspiring a man and a ball player he was. I'd like to ask you this for both your perspective and your son's. Growing up in Wisconsin, I mean, you don't have the warm weather that you get in so many other climates, especially the South and the West. And how does that affect your development as a baseball player? Well, I think overall, if I took Dalton out of the equation, I just think you get, you don't have um, probably enough time in, in your year to continue to develop your skills. Now, things have really changed because even Wisconsin has their affiliates now where there's baseball going on all the time, but you still need to get outside and you still need to hone your skills. And, and we talk so much about hitting these days. It's all about hitting, hitting. And I get it. If you can hit, you're going to find a place to play. But the, the baseball IQ, I think the difference between a lot of players in Dalton is baseball IQ, being around it, watching it, observing it. And you got to really fall in love with the game if you, if you want to develop. And I'm talking about running the bases, where to throw the ball. We don't do that anymore. So, but we were, you know, being up here, this was going to be home. And, you know, I decided that I took all the kids' scholarship money and I didn't, I didn't give them, I took it all and I built my own batting cage in the backyard. Now, I never got to use it, but all my kids used it. So it was like, you know, see how great you can be. So we spent a lot of time in there. Of course, I had my oldest daughter that went to Purdue, and um, she was a really good softball player there. And she got some scholarship money and got an education. And obviously with Dalton, it was like he was he was willing to put the time in. So I guess to me, Howard, it really comes down to finding the right person that can actually teach anybody that's from Florida – to Wisconsin, Canada, if you get the right person, you can get your skill sets down where you could possibly have a chance to play beyond high school, college, and maybe occasional professional baseball. So are we behind? Probably. Well, Dalton never got recruited. So it's like we had a big UW-Milwaukee to take him. So it's like that's kind of like where we're at here in Wisconsin. There's not a whole lot of recruitment going on. I've heard, you know, the Northeast can be mighty cold. You get in Connecticut, New England. So do you think players from cold weather climates sometimes might be late bloomers because they don't have the advantage of playing so much baseball when they're growing up? Absolutely right. I just think that because there's a skill set there, it's, it's about somebody laying eyes on, on, on a player and going, this guy has a skill set. Now, the other intangibles, though, is how much how much is this person willing to dedicate his time to becoming a better player? So I'm all for three sports. I'm not, I'm not asking anybody to go play baseball all year round. I think you're you're missing out. I think you're really missing out on being a true athlete. So I agree with you. I think there's a timeline there where you go. You know what? This guy's got a skill set. I mean. I came out of the same area here and I had Art Stewart, famous Kansas city scout come and tell me, he goes, go to college, just keep, just keep moving forward. And I think that's the big thing. I think more, more high school kids need to go to a college and keep growing and developing and, and, and getting to somewhere. It doesn't have to be a division one. It can be a division three, go somewhere where you can hone your skills and keep progressing. I think that's the, the biggest thing that I think every parent would love to have is, a chance to go play at a college level, no matter what level it is. And I think that's where you end up. You get a lot of your East coast players out of college. that are actually pretty good. We'll be back with more with Gary Var show after these words.
Gary Varsho in three, two, one. Gary, what are your thoughts when you look back at your playing career? That's a great question. Um, the grind of time that took me to get there and, and the appreciation of all the people that took the time. And you can go back to UW Oshkosh. I mean, I wasn't a big recruit, but Russ Tiedemann was a guy that believed in me and I got to play Division Three, went to three World Series. Um, got into professional ball, Dick Pohl, pretty good pitching coach. He believed in me and he saved my career in 84. Um, just the, the grind to get to the big leagues. And once I got there, uh, trying to establish myself and obviously, you know, the greatest thrill is, is obviously getting, being called up for the first time and seeing your number and you're suiting up. And that was that candlestick and coming to Wrigley and playing awesome, which we just left. It's just still awesome. Um, but obviously the turning point for me was when I got a chance to play for Jim Leland in, in Pittsburgh, one of the greatest three years I've ever spent with any human being in my life and made me the player I was. He understood, he understood players so well and where to match them up and had great success and obviously two playoff runs and um, getting, getting a base hit in game six in, in 91 was huge had a chance to go to the world series. I mean, I'm proud of that moment. I don't, I don't I mean, I'm, I'm just, so we had a chance and, um, you know, we just came up a little short, uh, Cincinnati playing with some really good people there. Unfortunately, we didn't have a very good year, but Cal Morris and Tom Browning and finishing off with Philly with Darren. Um, as a player, I was very cherished to play with a lot of terrific, terrific players and being able to play in an arena with, a lot of Hall of Famers during that era. So, and the coaching part, I, I, it's one thing I always wanted to go into. Of course, Leland told me a long time ago, you used to think you're done, go coach. So, and he knew it. And so, um, spending the three years in Reading was a great, great cherished time. I learned a lot about myself, things that I would do as a manager if I was going to manage someday and hopefully maybe be a coach. And got the opportunity to coach in Philly for, a number of years with Bo and Charlie Manuel and the Cleveland organization was actually pretty awesome. I spent a whole year there. saw you know, work for Mark Shapiro and it was awesome. I learned a lot about culture and the people that they had there. And Terry was a manager. It was just a great atmosphere. So that was, it was all really good. And obviously coming back to the pirates three different times as a, as a coach player, uh, a scout, uh, Hal Morris is one of my favorite people in the world. He brought me in the scouting world and taught me a lot and taught me a lot about more about the game than when you're coaching, you're teaching and you're competing and really trying to understand players and trying to help players and trying to evaluate them and just, you know, how, how good could I be at this? And he was very patient. So, uh, yeah, it's been a good run. It's been a really educational run. And at some point, you know, I, I, I've still got things to offer, but I'm good, you know, retired, uh, working with a lot of youth here, running my baseball league. Um, but it was, it's been, it's been a great run and it's time to maybe follow Dalton for a while and kind of enjoy that part. Of it. You mentioned when you're coaching, you're teaching, you're competing, trying to make players better. You're working with them every day. How about when you're scouting? What's the difference there? Scouting is you're not competing, which is, was really hard at first because you're watching the game as a, to me, managerial eyes and, you're looking at positioning, you're looking at what this guy's, you know, and you, and you have to kind of get out of that realm. You got to really evaluate what you're seeing, not, not trying to make sure people are in the right position or the guy didn't hit the cutoff. And so, I mean, uh, learning along the way, learning that a 19 year old is going to get better in a ball. Uh, you gotta, you gotta be patient with the younger. That's what Hal told me right away. Don't write them off right away. Just gotta be patient. Just, you know, Still got to keep these guys alive. And at the same time, he goes, you know, don't, you know, if you really feel strongly about something, go ahead and voice your opinion. It's okay. Cause you've got some background and some knowledge. You stood in the box. Um, and Jack Robertson from the pirates. Awesome. He's just an awesome person, first of all, and taught me a lot about scouting as well. And understood what I was doing. Cause I was doing a ton of triple a coverage and that's how you and I, you know, saw each other over the years. And, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed trying to evaluate 
who's a big leaguer, who's a part-time big leaguer, who's, you know, and trying to really get each kid a, an opportunity. They didn't want to write anybody off. I think that's important as a scout because I think a lot of scouts just write them off going, well, this guy, this, guy, this guy's a triple-A player. This guy's a triple-A player. You know what? Sometimes a triple-A player can come up there and help a team win. And I think that's sort of like kind of where I went into. So I enjoy it. I enjoy the report writing. I enjoy the people I met and still keep in touch with a lot of guys. So I've met a lot of people in this game, and I'm very fortunate for that. And a lot of good baseball people, a lot of good baseball friends. Well, you've been a credit to the game. And you mentioned Jim Leland earlier, and I feel so strongly that he belongs in the Hall of Fame for all that he accomplished as a manager. You know, you're judged on wins and losses. His record's fine. But more than that, the things he brought to the table, which you touched upon a few minutes ago. Well, now here's a guy that hit a career 222, I think, in, in minor leagues and turned himself into a, a, a awesome major league manager. And, uh, and remember, he took the Pirates from nothing and won three straight division titles. Took the Marlins to a World Series. I mean, took the Tigers to the World Series. What more does he have to do to put himself in that Hall of Fame category? I mean, I'm waiting, and I just can't believe that we've waited this long anyway. So, uh, and you know, if you ever a chance to meet Jim, he's, he's a people guy. I mean, he could, he could be a car salesman and you'd love to buy one from him because he cares, he cares about people. And, you know, I called him a couple of weeks ago and, and thanked him for everything that he's done for me. And, oh, we shared stories. And I mean, who he's got time, he's got time for people. And, and plus he's still in the game. So it's time for somebody to recognize this guy and go get his butt in there. I agree so strongly. I got to know Jim in 1979 because he managed the Evansville triplets in 79, 80 and 81. And that's where, he developed his friendship with Tony La Russa, who managed yeah. the Iowa Oaks in 79. You know, you like to keep your sense of humor in this game, too. And Jim's first year with the Tiger, with the Pirates, 1986, they had a rough season, really yeah. rough season. Anyway, he was at the World Series that year between the Mets and the Red Sox. And the Mets beat the Pirates 17 of 18 times that season. 17 and one. So Jim Leland was asked by a reporter, what do you think of the Mets? And he said, well, if they were really good, they would have beaten us all 18. <laughs> That's Jim to a T and it doesn't, he doesn't miss a beat. And he, you know, you'd watch him and he, he just has his pulse on everything. He understands yeah. the clubhouse. He's got his pulse on the clubhouse. And obviously as far as strategy, he's excellent too. Well, the thing is, I think what he does so well is he makes sure he touches his players, especially when you're going poorly. I mean, so many guys go, well, he's, he's not doing well, he's not doing well, and you ship him out to AAA. He's, he's a believer in people because that's what you need. He's, he's a believer in the bullpen. Guy had a bad outing, next day you're in for a third inning, get back, get back on that horse and give us some success. I mean, he did it over and over. Bob Kipper's a, a classic example, of just getting a left-hander out and, you know, me getting some pinch hits because he matched me up so well and, but believed in me. I'm going to tell you, there's so many times that I said, you know, I, I stink right now. And he goes, yeah, I know you stink, but you're on this team. So, you know, get out there and get going because you're going to be part of this. So let's go. I mean, awesome. He just, he's just awesome that way. And so we, we always had a really special relationship and again, grateful for him putting me on the map to have success and be able to have a long career. Growing up in Wisconsin, were you a Milwaukee Brewers fan? Well, absolutely. I mean, that was when Yount and that was when Ben Ogilvy and George Scott and uh, Eduardo Rodriguez. So yeah, Jimmy Gander obviously was an Oshkosh guy. So when he started playing, it's like, oh, there's an Oshkosh connection with the school I went to. But of course, listen to Euchre and Merle Harmon in the booth. It's hard. It's hard not to be a Milwaukee Brewer fan when growing up. And but at that time, there wasn't many games on. All of a sudden, WGN came on, and all of a sudden, here are the Cubs, and you're watching the Cubs every day. So it's like, kind of fell in love with the Cubs. Yeah, I can understand that. Appreciate that. You mentioned this. You know, being with Dalton and the whole family at Wrigley Field. The atmosphere at Wrigley Field is so special. It's electric. I mean, until, you know, being a player there and walking to the ballpark and walking back because I live close enough and seeing the fans outside and 
you feel it. You feel it when you're walking in. And then as a player leaving the clubhouse and you're walking through the tunnel and all of a sudden you're into the dugout and you have this bright sunshine and this aura that when you get out there, it's magical. You can't explain it. I mean, I try to explain it, but it's like, it's magical. And to sit in a Wrigley and to have 35,000 fans cheer you on, uh, it's just, it's just a different, it's just a different, it's a, it's, it's the best place you can be for old time baseball, the way it used to be. And the fans make it and the arena makes it. It's just, it's a very special place. Well, Gary, you achieved so much in the game over the years and you helped so many people along the way too. You've been a credit to the game. Thank you so much for taking time out to speak with us today. Howard, I enjoyed it. Don't underestimate. You've been at this game a long time and you're great at it. So we, I appreciate you as well. Well, thank you so much. That's Gary Varsha. We'll, we'll have more after these words. to our guest, Gary Varsho. Next week, we'll talk to Mark Boyle, voice of the Indiana Pacers. See you next week, everybody.